So it'd be interesting to know people would come on the round table after that or use this as an opportunity to learn more about Confluent. Yeah. Because like we, like we talked about, I think we, we did this in, in Jakarta. It sort of occurred to us, you know, how fast Confluent was growing or is growing and uh, the adoption of the technology. Oh, yeah, a lot of people. Let's put it this way, that we are at growing at rapid speed. Mm -hmm. Is there a way for me to, like, look at the screen or if I share my screen, I just see the whole thing? Let me see. Oh, oh sorry. Someone did say hide. Okay, got it. Yeah, just keep your face on screen and then uh, one can... As I'm, I'm running this in a browser. I can just zoom. I just pinch my mm -hmm. mouse and I zoom the size. So if I want to increase the size of the presentation, I can I can just do that by zooming it in. Right. So there isn't uh, isn't actually a, it doesn't seem to be a button, but you can still zoom it. Yeah, my only challenge is that I can see you, uh, mm -hmm. but like when I go on the share my screen mode, I don't see my face anymore. You don't see yours. Okay. Um, do you see the chat? Yes, I, I do see the chat right now. Well, let, let's communicate through the chat. So a few more people joining. Hello, Val. Mm -hmm. Sionko, hello. Different people, different backgrounds. Chin, and we have Christian. So seem to be quite technical. Well, technical job titles, but let's not assume that this is a technical discussion. Okay, um, how are we? We're two minutes okay. into this, so let's let's sort of do some introductions here. So I have um, Ananda from um, Confluent, and um, his. I'll let him introduce himself because I know the experience is geared around financial services, but there's always a lot more to it. We're currently solutions engineering head in Asia with a focus on financial services, right? So that's very apt because the topic of this uh, round table is transforming the financial services industry with event stream data. And in particular, looking at use cases. Now we're quite lucky. We've got a good 30 minutes for this presentation. So there'd be plenty of chance for, for questions. I have some questions here already uh, given to us. And uh, I hope that everyone in the chat can pay attention, take notes, and, and ask those questions. Um, so the purpose will be to delve into the rise of streaming data, how it's being used to transform the financial services industry, providing critical, timely information. Now, in the case of detecting fraud, the legacy system integration, empowering new services. So that, that's a wide breadth of, of, of capabilities. I know for the, the last round table, uh, one of the, the, the ending points was that trend to tie together disparate data and events. So this seems to be a, a, an important um, topic. Uh, for Confluent, we're going to hear about that, so I don't want to be talking too much about Confluent other, other than the creators of Apache Kafka and event enterprise-ready event streaming platform. And all the uh, financial services case studies will be talked about, so I don't want to repeat that. Okay, so I believe what we'll be doing here is going through a few slides, just get us uh, centered on the topic. And then we'll be proceeding to address questions as they come up in the chat. Um, let me see. Has anyone else joined? I think a few people. Hello, Paul. And um, there will be more joining, let's hope. But this seems to be about the typical group size. OK, with that, Ananda, I'll hand it to you. I'll put myself on mute. OK, go ahead, please. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. So um, hello, everybody. You know. Um, Awesome that uh, you guys decided to participate in this uh, chat. And you know, uh, let's hope we can make this uh, interactive. Uh, I run the solutions engineering team for Confluent in Asia. Uh, Confluent as a company is, uh, is the company which was founded by the original creators of Apache Kafka. And we believe we are the foremost uh, company that provides 
solutions that help companies to uh, use data in motion as well as data and rest to create intelligent applications. Uh, in terms of uh, where I come from, I have about 20 plus years of providing consulting as well as advisory services to financial institutions in uh, emerging markets. And before Confluent, I used to work in and IBM. Um, my specialization is app modernization techniques, and I'm learning all the while from my extraordinary team of solution engineers on database modernization, which is really a fundamental uh, disruption that we see in terms of you know getting uh, things to work better uh, you know in the new microservices world. So uh, in today's chat, you know we have a discussion around uh, you know what we are seeing in the business, uh, what are some of our learnings, uh, what use cases we are seeing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I thought that I'd use this, uh, you know, opportunity to give you guys a perspective of how things came to be what it is, right? So I'm going to take the example of the financial services, but almost every industry except for the cloud native digital industry has actually gone through this evolution. So if you looked at your banks or your insurance companies in the 1960s to 1990s, there was a mainframe and there was like a three terminal uh, you put in uh, some use some function keys and some numeric keys and essentially you know you got uh, responses to things like your balance update your address change etc etc world was great you know everything worked well fantastic uh, in the 90s what happened was that uh, the world suddenly saw the interactions of a couple of new uh, channels so this new channel called the ATM emerged. Uh, branch tellers started becoming modernized, and that led to the formation of this thing called the branch server. And then, of course, you know, you had the website. Uh, the website was disconnected. Most people had no idea what to do with it. Uh, it had weird things like a chairman's message, or you know, uh, this is what we are. And sometimes, uh, you know, it was like a corporate social responsibility. Uh, part of a bank to have a website. But uh, with this came a lot of complexity. And this complexity started manifesting itself in terms of you know the information that was required, as well as the uh, recency of information. And uh, I don't know how many of you are, are old enough. I'm old. You know, those white hair are real. Uh, this was the time when you know a check used to take seven to ten or maybe even 30 days to get cleared. This was the time where you know uh, even for you to get information about your account, uh, you really needed to have uh, at least a T plus one day notice to get the full information about the funds that were available in your account. A couple of interesting things start happening at this time. The ATM started making an appearance, but the branch was still the most important part of the business. In the first decade of 2000s, a lot changed. Uh, and this was driven primarily by the fact that uh, two important technologies happened in the financial services world. One was the uh, front end to back end integration provided by modern core banking systems. Uh, this was like, uh, you know, Oracle's FlexCube, uh, Infosys's Finical, Terminos, etc., etc. And the other one was the user choice that was provided in retail or wholesale banking through the mobile banking, internet banking, contact center, and the ATM channels. Uh, again, you know, uh, to reduce the complexity as well as have a state transition between the various channels, a new layer got introduced called the SOA layer. And this layer, you know, essentially tried to handle a lot of the business processes which did not have a core dependency on the system of record to be offloaded off the. Most times this was orchestrated through an enterprise service bus, or in some cases, even you know uh, a point-to-point -point integration carried out by message queues. Uh, the system worked perfectly well for almost 15 years, starting from the year 2000. 
except that uh, it was quite difficult to change because the business logic for the system was kept everywhere and which meant that if a new channel or a new partner needed to be integrated you know you could have as long wait times as nine months six months with the biggest times being taken care of uh, by factors like uh, you know impact analysis like uh, you know business logic and where it existed etc because the core thing was that the business logic actually existed everywhere so you had business logic in the channels you had business logic in the soa layer you had business logic in the integration layer and you had business logic also in the core systems now in the later part of the year 2000s a big change happened so the big change that happened was that a new channel started coming in and this was silicon valley silicon valley is like google pay i mean you know in 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 singapore it's like grab and and there was this ecosystem of partners who now had more customers or or clients than the banking world earlier banks could control everything as they had full control on the client and all of their transactions but in once with silicon valley started coming in bank came more like a processor of payments processor of information rather than the origin actions of the relationships so to enable this what happened in the second decade of the 2000 is a new channel and this is growing rapidly came up so this was loosely coupled as an ecosystem you've heard it by different names like a api ecosystem open apis or even you know uh, things like uh, platform ecosystem etc but essentially think of these as uh, you know partners who could use banking services and then have a mutually uh, convenient relationship between both the partners and the uh, bank that was offering the services now most of these partners had very little uh, they were tech systems so tech systems means that they were not ready to invest or wait for the large amount of times that financial services at many times uh, required to actually get them into the entire system so which is why you know the first thing that came was the external api layer now what was the best way to build the external api layer you had business services which had already built in the soa layer as you can see here many people decided that the best way to get to this apis was to uh, just just expose this uh, business services as api endpoints the challenge with that was that when they did that uh, they saw that the biggest issue was sometimes related with business logic change because most of the ecosystems had their own way of integrating to this uh, financial institution and the second one was you know the ability to test in a variety of situations so as a result of that many of the financial services institutions also we start also started a journey which was called the microservices journey now microservices you know you would have heard of different things associated with microservices people say you know microservices are independent business functionality etc etc but if you look at the domain driven design uh, descriptions you will hear the term of microservices and event driven being used in conjunction the reason is that if you look at businesses whether a new greenfield business or a brownfield business the discussion point is always that these businesses occurred in the past and so you know a check gets processed or a client uh, updates his uh, address uh, so what it means is that there are uh, a lot of business processes and to an extent even a full business can be understood as a collection of events which when satisfied lead to a outcome which is a business outcome so you could literally say that you know a notification is a event for example or a payment is an event now when you have these events that are happening these are then going back to the back end core systems or the holders of data and asking for information they can ask for data synchronously they can also ask for data asynchronously now synchronously means that you start putting a huge amount of load onto your back end systems and not every transaction is equal you know you should have it synchronous transactions are usually meant for 
uh, high value, low volume transactions. So it's not meant for you know, just checking your balance, which you do 10 times in a mobile app, for example. Uh, but it is definitely used if you're transacting in you know dollars to move money from point A to point B. So which is why you know microservices started getting broken up into you know synchronous microservices and asynchronous microservices, and with that came uh, other problems associated with uh, retention of data, associated with the ability to make, manage persistence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So at the data level also, this started creating a lot of change. So, you know, certain new tech started emerging at this point, you know, like streaming, caching, NoSQL data lakes, et cetera, which in together actually provides the information uh, to the microservices, which then are surfaced out through an external API layer. So this is where we are right now. And, you know, this ecosystem is actually becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, I'm just going to do a quick introduction to event streaming. And then, of course, you know, me and Jonathan and all of us can have a chat, right? So if you looked at not not too far away, but maybe 20 years back, there were two kinds of data. So there were operational databases and there was relational databases. So you kept transactional data in operational databases and you kept analytical data in relational databases. And because different people wanted different kinds of information out of it, you know, the squiggly mess or the spaghetti diagram or the uh, issues associated with different applications asking for different things through different means came up. And this is what enterprise architecture looks like uh, to a large extent. Now, the old world had two kinds of, uh, you know, methods of integration. So one was ETL, which was scalable, but it was batched. The other one was EAI, which is real time, but not scalable. And what people realized more and more was that what they needed was a platform that was not just real time, but also scalable. So something that could move large volumes of data, something that could move a variety of data, and something that could move this data in real time so that you really took advantage of events as opposed to trying to uh, get intelligence out of data at rest. So that is where the streaming platforms came in and Jcrebs, Chundra, and you know, uh, Nehan Arkare, who were the original founders, uh, creators of Apache Kafka, they also brought about a company called Confluent at that stage. So what's the value that happens and why is this important from an API perspective? Let's take an example. I mean, you can have multiple applications. All of these applications are logging. And what you need to do is to do some analytics on this log, maybe identify some false positives in a money laundering kind of scenario, maybe understand, you know, uh, behavior or something like the other, right? And what that could be as a series of tasks could be that, you know, you need to uh, transform this, like create some aggregates, you need to drop something, you need to mask something, etc., and finally make it available in a data warehouse which can then be consumed by downstream application. So if you, if you do this, you know, works great when the target is just one. But as with emerging technology, let's say you had all of this information in the data warehouse, and now suddenly, you know, you have to go to a new area where you have to do all of this. And let's say you want to put it in Hadoop or Cassandra, etc. In this old architecture, you would have to write all of these hooks once again, test it, and to get this onboarded would take a long amount of time and potentially even have errors associated with it. Now, if you look at microservices, you know, this architecture or APIs, this is this is not a very scalable or an easy to deploy architecture. So given this, what we finally did was uh, we introduced the streaming platform. The streaming platform takes all of this information and does all of the changes within the streaming platform and then can make it available as a REST API, which can be consumed by any down, uh, downstream systems in terms of information that they're looking for. So this could be microservices, this could be APIs, this could be a Hadoop system, a data warehouse, whatever it is, right? So the core value then becomes that your time to market, you know, reduces uh, significantly. And most importantly, you know, you have a variety of mechanisms by which you provide information, you maintain state, and uh, you also, uh, you know, 
manage the overall cross relationship between transactions in the microservice world very effectively. So, I mean, with that background, uh, you know, Jonathan, let's switch over now to the conversation. Uh, and, you know, uh, we can actually uh, get up, get out and have a chat now. I'm, I'm so, uh, you know, I'm sorry, maybe I went a little bit overboard on the slides, but uh, I thought yeah, that was a good perspective. Yeah, I, I appreciate that they were sort of hand drawn as well, which so makes, makes a difference. Um, and there's no quiz, right? There's, we don't have a quiz to, to check people have been uh, paying attention. I, the question there is, I wonder how much is this familiar with people? Because we were talking about this earlier in that you were suggesting that in enterprises, some enterprises, this is quite familiar, but in other, sorry, in some uh, digital native companies, it's quite familiar, but some enterprises, it's not yet familiar. Okay, so um, I'm just wondering from that, in terms of customers, I mean, uh, I know that uh, research here, Citigroup, RBC, DBS, Bank, Mandiri, would there be any sort of specific um, stories that you would have from financial services in the region, I know, oh, yeah. Singapore, so Indonesia, Malaysia? where you've, you've seen this adopted and where are they now? Where are they moving to? So um, I think, you know, the initial uh, streams of adoption were more experimental, but now we are in the mainstream state. And what we see is that uh, there are like uh, five to six areas that we see repeated on and on. So uh, one of the most useful ones is to unlock the value of data that is there in your core systems. You know, typically when we work with core systems, people uh, connect to them either through MQ or through more expensive uh, batch oriented methods. Uh, so uh, confluent solutions have provided a mechanism by which the information is now available more in real time and uh, through REST APIs, which can be consumed by, you know, almost all requesters. And this is especially useful in a microservices world. Uh, so that's one use case which we see a lot. Uh, this usually manifests as a notification service to begin with, you know, like a cross-channel notification. This is the kind of thing that you see when you do a credit card transaction and, and in real time it comes to you that, hey, you made this transaction. You want to pay for this in 12 monthly installments at 0% interest or 1% or whatever it is. At the back of it, you know, there's an event driven architecture that is actually driving that. Uh, imagine how effective it is uh, in terms of fraud, understanding and reconciliation, because now you're able to act on something in real time, as opposed to, you know, acting on something in, uh, uh, you know, uh, a pretty uh, T plus one or a T plus two or a T plus five day manner also. So obviously that's a one advantage that we've seen happen in this region. The other one is that uh, many uh, smart banks uh, have actually taken this opportunity and actually exposed their core banking services as and you know, one of the uh, most ex exciting ones that I've seen is uh, how DVS Bank has used their Payla platform to, you know, sell a variety of pla uh, of services uh, to its Payla consumers, uh, you know, and 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 these are driven primarily by APIs uh, at DVS. So that's another one you could call it open banking or API-driven, uh, you know, uh, transactions. The third area that we see is in terms of real-time contextual offers. So, you know, uh, the credit card example that I saw are giving uh, real-time credit increases for uh, transactions or doing click stream analysis for, you know, cards on the mortgage side. Uh, those are all amazing examples of how the uh, event-driven data and APIs have been able to trigger hot leads for a lot of downstream business applications. And uh, the last areas are more regulatory. So these are around reconciliation for end of day reporting to regulatory authorities or, you know, uh, ATM fraud detection, uh, as well as anti-money laundering for reducing the number of false positives. Gosh, that's a lot of use cases. And, uh, you know, this was providing critical, timely information 
to detect fraud, tie together legacy system and power new services, right? That was in the uh, the summary of this presentation. So I think we've just about done, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And you've given us thought, what, what more could there be to ask? Well, really encourage some uh, something in the chat here. I think you can see Ananda is very keen to, to share on this. Um, we did have some questions come in from when you guys registered and they have been matched to this session. So I'm going to, rather than give my own questions on this, I'm going to just look through here and see what we've got. Okay. So really the point I was asking there, what's happening specifically with banking in Asia and ASEAN, and you talked about new services, core banking integration, real-time contextual stuff like fraud, and also the regulatory stuff, right? Would there be anything else that is happening? Now, Asia, ASEAN is a big region, right? Let's take Singapore. Mm -hmm. Different levels of maturity, right? So with these transaction system, one imagines IBM Z series, just efficiently handing how many 10,000, 20,000 transactions per minute or whatever. As an example, uh, what have you seen perhaps contrasting Singapore and you pick another country to say where, where, where we're at in terms of this uh, transformative use of data and, and events? I think uh, the core, uh, I think this is a complicated answer that I'm about to give because this question is very contextual, right? Because even within Singapore, we have different maturity in terms of services that we can actually access. Uh, so think, think, digital, of, think of something inspiring and aspirational. Right. <laughs> right. And, and I'll, I'll give you some examples which we actually go through on a daily basis, but I, I would rather color it as pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? I mean, uh, pre-COVID in Singapore, we still used to carry cash. We had to use cash in some way or the other. Now, post-COVID, if you look at it, uh, you know, your entire payments industry, and this just doesn't mean just the banks, but the entire ecosystem has become QR or fast oriented, right? Now, that's a classic example of a major disruption that has taken place because your investments in ATMs, your investments in branches, your investments in uh, high value uh, clearing systems, has, has suddenly got now issues that you are having to contend with, right? So that's one thing. The second one is that uh, e-commerce has had a massive boom in Singapore, which means that people are actually vying for the credit that is required to satisfy e-commerce needs. So, you know, not everyone has all the money that you need for a Apple iPhone 12, but hey, everybody has a mechanism if the right bank provides the credit to get it in the equated payment plans. So equated payment plans or contextual offers are reigning, you know, very strong in e-commerce kind of transactions, which means that, you know, uh, this was not something which was there. This was something post facto that you had to do with a lot of uh, bells and whistles attached to it. Actually, do it seamlessly during a transaction with the e-commerce providers actually offering this to you in real time. Now, none of this is possible until and unless your backend infrastructure is ready to actually process all of this information in real time. So that's an example. Now, outside of Singapore, I think the digital wave is massive because for citizen services, for financial services, whether it is origination or whether it is, you know, settlement of transactions, uh, most governments, especially with not having people move around due to COVID situations, have become almost 100% digital. So in India, for example, you know, uh, the entire origination systems for banks has been linked very strongly with uh, the uh, identity system. And as a result, you know, you can do literally uh, non-contact based uh, transactions for a lot of the banking uh, life cycle that most people used to be with. So hope that gives you a better idea of some of the big time things that are happening in the financial services world, leveraging APIs. Uh, you did that. You did that very simply, right? A, a complex topic because um, you know one of the other questions: what's changed since uh, pre-COVID and post-COVID? So I think you touched on that, and also a few more examples on the services which are made possible. 
make it sound yeah. very make it sound very easy, but also you've alluded and you inferred there's integration to identity systems. We had a um, a CPES um, company on before, right? So omni-channel communications, right? Um, and it, it, it sounds very ideal, right? All this happening in the real world, obviously every company, every customer need is different. So have you got any best practices? Um, because I also noticed personally, you've come from other, other companies like Pivotal and, you know, APIs are not everything, right? <laughs> it, it, it's it's also about the alignment with the customers, with the business, with the legacy systems. So, could you step us through that? Best practices, recommendations. Uh, right. Maybe maybe it's some sort of consulting services. They used to be possible, uh, po popular. Right. So. I I think one of the most important things that uh, organizations are using more and more now is a concept known as domain driven design. Uh, it's called DD, uh, DDD or in short form. So what domain driven design is, uh, is, is in simple terms is like, is to look at a bank in terms of discrete business domains, which interact with each other to give an outcome to the personas who deal with the bank. So what does that mean? Like, uh, let's take a consumer requesting a payment service. There are multiple parts of this, right? And I, I'm, I'm simplifying this because there's a lot of complexity, but you know, in the interest of time, you have the first ability of the customer to registering themselves for the payment service. So let's call it registration. Now, if you look at a registration itself, that is a distinct domain. So when you register for a service, you have to prove, you have to prove your credit worthiness in a way. You have to link up your bank accounts. You have to fund your bank accounts. Now, domain-driven design is strongly related with the practice known as event storming, which is one of the core methods by which you actually identify domain. Event storming is then, then related with the ability to see a full business as a collection of events. So I registered for a payment service. Then once I did, I funded my account. Then I created a payor. I created a payee. So all of these, if you look at it, are events that are happening to give you the outcome, which is sending money from, say, Jonathan to me or me to Jonathan. Now, this is a function that a lot of organizations, whether these are digital natives or enterprises, are doing today. And what they are doing is to break down those big monoliths that have shaped their technology architecture into smaller, more discrete and independently functioning uh, units. Those units in technical terms are usually called as microservices and to concentrate the logic within these microservices. Now, if you remember in my logic has was earlier in UX, uh, middle tiers, backend systems, everywhere. To concentrate the logic in a particular area, which means that the dependency management and the change and the testing required can become much less. Now, obviously, this is not a journey. This is not doesn't happen like I tell you, hey, Jonathan, tomorrow we are going to do event driven design and domain driven design. Yeah, let, let, let's it's just have good. a three, three hour workshop and we're, 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 we're sort out um, uh, yeah. business banking services. Yeah, <laughs> that's what happens in YouTube, right? In 30 yeah. minutes, you get to do domain driven design. The reality is that, and you know, uh, there are lots of banks in Singapore and across the region which are in this journey as are digital natives where it takes years actually because you have to change the skill mix in the organization these are skills in high demand you know you are going to compete with facebook google and even confluent for the skills right second one is that the way you deal with software technology you know and there's this term called agile but forget about agile but getting software code very fast out of the door and making value associated with it you know, that's the second yeah. big change that happened. The third is automation. So how do you automate the various processes, approvals, audits that you have to do, which ensures that, you know, the outcome is met on that particular day, particular cost, etc. And all of this, of course, has been helped a lot by cloud technology, virtualization, Kubernetes, etc., etc. So it's, it's, it's not a frivolous thing. It takes time. But I guess there's a recipe or a template and... The core one of that is domain driven design. Yeah, well, you caught, caught my interest. I don't know about everybody else. Certainly, I've not heard of this way of looking at microservices. 
in a more systematic way. There's many definitions right. of it. Uh, another question is, what's the hype about Kafka? Heard, heard about it, what's special about it, and so forth. So I think I'm going to take that question, and then I'm going to say, looking at the people in this chat here or in this room, a lot of developers, a few product managers, Okay, so we come in, we kind of know our toolkit, we know what the IT department, but we might have to make recommendations, right? We might have to solve problems. So perhaps in that context, you know, the history, Confluent, Kafka, and then the current tooling that you provide, could you provide some context to take the participants here through how they might use this stuff or work with their business and stakeholders? to try and deliver the microservices or the business value? Right, so, yeah. no, no worries. Uh, that's a fantastic question, actually, Jonathan. So, uh, you know, building a microservice in Spring Boot or, or Spring is very easy, you know? By the way, Stack Overflow is full of code that you can copy and get it done very fast. And, but, and then just uh, run up a, a Docker or something like that, and then it's, it's all live, isn't it? That's simple. But that doesn't happen because you have to source data for this, right? And not only do you have to source data, but you have to maintain some persistence. Uh, now, that's where the problem starts emerging, right? ETL is a batch is process. So imagine you doing an update using a microservice, but guess what? The update happens one day after, right? That's not going to be happen because by that time, there's a lot of fraud that can happen and a lot of other things that can happen. Then you have EAI, which is fantastic because it goes and updates everything in real time, but it cannot persist a transaction whereby it is waiting for some other you know, microservices to actually complete that transaction. Mm. Now, if you bridge these two, that's where Kafka comes in. Not only are we able to do transactions in real time, we can also move large volumes of data and we can also persist this data. So you can retain data now in Confluent Solutions for almost unlimited amounts of time using tiered storage and infinite uh, storage on the cloud. The second problem that comes is that this is on Kubernetes or on cloud tech. The older tech is actually not ready for things like this. So you also reduce the technical debt significantly by bringing in this tech. Because you know, not only can you make the information available in your core systems to the microservices in, in real time and in an asynchronous or synchronous manner, whichever you choose to. And more importantly, you know, we have open standards that allow you to integrate to this uh, infrastructure very fast. So I'm hearing orchestration of events and data and putting, putting yeah. on, on, the, on a modern microservices architecture. All right. Yeah. So there's going to be a step. There's going to be processes to analyze what we talked about earlier, the best practices, uh, domain design, the event storming, and then that's where Kafka come, that come where Confluent comes in to provide the tooling to orchestrate that. All and, right. And so we are and, and we are almost becoming like a de facto standard. And you know, I'd be happy to have conversations with anyone on helping them to unravel these problems. Okay, that's cool. I mean, I'm looking at the time here, right? Uh, and uh, coming up to 35 minutes, which was our allotted time. So right. um, what might people do apart from attend the, uh, the session tomorrow morning and also visit your booth? Is there any way they could contact you? Would there be any developer platforms that they could get in and take a look at your services? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So one of the things, uh, two things that I would love to uh, let you uh, Thank you for, by the way, that question. That's a great segue. So one is, uh, you know, uh, everyone here can sign up to Confluent Cloud and you'll get immediately a $200 voucher. You can do it on AWS, GCP or, uh, or Azure. Uh, you know, start playing with it. You'll have a lot of fun. I can assure you, right? So that's number one. My colleague Naveen did a hands-on workshop today and perhaps read the uh, recording and have a, have a look at it. That will give you a good idea of you know how to actually use this uh, solutions. And uh, last but not the least, you know we have a lot of talks and meetups that happen in Singapore as well as across the region. So go to meetup.com, search up Kafka, and you'll see a lot of these events happening. So I think Jonathan, those would be the three things you know that would be really valuable. Okay, maybe we could just put that in the uh, in the chat. Uh Sure. Uh, after this, because we'll keep the chat window open for a few minutes. Um, okay, yeah. so 
our time is is done for for now. Um, thanks very much, Ananda. Thanks for everybody yeah. who's attended. Uh, we welcome your questions. If you want to put them in the chat now, of course, you can catch up with uh, with Confluent after after this session. Okay. Thank so with so that, much. recognizing there's other tracks for people to go to, we close this session, this roundtable session. And thanks very much. Thank you. Welcome. Bye-bye.